Amen. I was thinking of what uh, Sheila was saying today when she was talking about if the kids ever wanted to, to uh, act like they were a preacher. When I was a um, uh, pastor and I went and saw a, a family that had been visiting our church and they had twins about three or four and um, I was at their house and the grandparents lived right behind them. So we were talking and everything and all of a sudden um, Parker, who was like, like I said, three or four, he came running through the yard in his underwear and a Superman cape. <laughs> and he wanted to see the preacher because he was going to be a preacher one day. And they told me how he would get up on the front porch and his twin sister, um, uh, she had to lead the singing, take up the offering. She was the congregation. She had to come to the altar because she was the only one out there. And, um, but I, I just want you all to know he's finished college and he is a preacher. So uh, God knows what he's doing, even when he puts it in the hearts of the, the, the little ones that he is in charge and that he is good. And he has plans for us, plans for good and not for evil, to give us a future and a hope. He wants to do a great work in our lives and in our community. And uh, you may question that when you look at your circumstances in your life. You may say, um, I, I don't see the hand of God, or it seems like it's awfully dark and, and dreary or difficult. And maybe we're looking to have the heaven life now. But this is the path where we're getting ready for heaven. This is the place where uh, we may not be there yet, but we're on our way. So I'm grateful for what God's doing in our life. I'm grateful when I see his hand, and I'm grateful that I don't, when I don't see his hand, I still know that his hand is there and that he has set us free. Praise God. For all eternity, he has set us free. If you have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 20, Today is the uh, fifth of our core values that we're going to be studying. Uh, the first core value is we are to worship God. We are loving with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Our second core value is we're to be at uh, peace with our brother. We're to have fellowship one amongst each other, right? Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. The third core value is evangelism. You think of the three fingers, you think of the three crosses, Christ being the center, where he paid the price for our redemption. The fourth is discipleship. He said, go for make disciples. He said, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So as God has put in his words, we need to find these teachings and not just put them in our head, we need to put them in our heart. Not just say these are things that God says, but how is it he wants to apply those to our life? And number five is service. It's the fifth core value. Not because it's the least important, because all of them have equal value. You need, when, when we say love others in the same way that you want to be loved, do unto others the way you want people to do unto you, that's big words. And can we say that it's not always lived? Sometimes we want to do the right thing, but we don't always. And how great it would be to live in a world where everybody put everybody as equals and treated everybody with respect and honor because God created this for such and expects it of us and wants us to give it to others as well. But yet we live in a world that, that doesn't always do that. But God gives us common grace. Everyone matters to God. We're supposed to lead with love. And God looks at everyone the same. And we must see other people, not simply the way we see them, but the way Christ sees them. There's nothing really more... Um, needed than this subject of service we stand in agreement on this we know that God loves us and we know that we should love others we agree with this when I was praying over this and I was thinking of all the places that I could preach a passage that talked about what it meant to serve there's so many so we have to ask the question why is it if we all know that we're supposed to love God and we're supposed to love each other, and we all know that we want to be loved in the same manner, why don't we? Why don't we love others to the extent that Christ wants us to? Why is it that if uh, Christ were here right now, he would treat people differently than we treat people? So what I wanted to do today was not to say we're supposed to love each other. I, I'm believing that we already know that to be true. What I'm going to do today is I want us to see the impediments to that, 
what's keeping us from loving each other. And, and it's here within us. So if you have your Bibles, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? Matthew chapter 20, <laughs> verse number 17. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. This is the third time that he is making these remarks of his death, burial, and resurrection to the disciples. Now they're going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. How specific. He's telling them something that's about to happen, but not in generalities, in unbelievably uh, detailed specifics. When you start looking at these things and how he put it out there for everyone to, to see and to know so that when we look back upon it and everything that he said was fulfilled exactly the way that he said it, things that would be unbelievably uh, beyond what any person could manipulate. He couldn't just make these things fall together. The most outlandish things culminating in, they will take me, they will kill me, but specifically, they're going to uh, beat me with whips, they're going to beat me up, and then they're going to crucify me, but don't worry about it. Though they will kill me on the cross and bury me, I will be resurrected. Outlandish. Who would make such a plea, an unbelievable statement about themselves? But Christ did. Verse 20. Now, we don't know the time frame between 19 and 20, but we know it's very close as they were approaching Jerusalem. And it says, Then the mother of Zebedee, Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, grant, these, excuse me, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on the right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. I wonder what Jesus' face looked like when he turned and answered back in verse 22. Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but, to those, uh, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased, that's an understatement, with the two brothers. And Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, the Romans, lorded over them, but those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be, it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's pray. Now, Father, this is your word. It is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word. It is for our benefit. And Father, I just pray that this morning that by the leadership of the Holy Spirit that you would allow us to see ourselves not simply in the way that we think, in the way that we're comfortable with, but Lord, that you would allow us to see ourselves through your eyes, through your heart, through your plans, and through your will. And Father, if that is done, help us to move from where we are to where we need to be. Father, give us the ability to look into the mirror of our own soul, our own motives, our wishes and our own wants. And Father, may we see the plumb line, the plumb line of truth that you always honor and bless. My Father, you always lift up for the glory, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior and Lord. And Father, you see New Holland that you love and Lord, they love you. There's no doubt about that. And Father, you left us in this world, and we have been affected by you, but we've also been affected by this world. And we have followed your leadership, but Lord, we've followed the leadership of this world as well. So today, 
Shine your love in our hearts. Shine your will in our lives. And Father, may we understand why it is that you allowed this to come in. In a, in a normal day with your disciples, may it be a normal day with us. May your truths be real. Change us, Lord. Oh God, change us for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. The first time Jesus spoke out loud the plan of heaven that he would go to Jerusalem and give his life. I wonder how he felt. It had been planned before the foundation of the world, and yet now he's with his disciples and he's speaking it out loud. I wonder if they heard it, couldn't really understand it, brushed it off. Maybe it was one of those, I'll think about it later moments. Y'all know what that's like. You think about it, you're affected by it, but you put it out of mind, out of sight, and come back and maybe think about it later, a different time, different plot, different. Maybe I'll understand it better later. Then the second time came. Then the third time. Now there's a redundancy factor. Lord, what are you doing? What are you saying? But I believe like the first time and like the second time, it was beyond their grasp of seeing and understanding. So they simply said, okay. But it never rang true to their heart, their heart with desires and wishes and wants and, and goals. It maybe didn't meet their plans, so to speak. So laying those words aside, they continued with what they thought was best, what they understood. Now, please, let's give them some props and respect. They're following Christ. They left their old life behind, and they've reached a certain point uh, of, of following the will of God. But now God's asking them to, that, to, to believe beyond. God's putting some things that they're only going to be able to grasp by faith. And they're having troubles and issues with this thing of God's plan for their life on earth and their thoughts and plans for God's will in their life on earth. And then it's kind of the subject is dropped. And as we see they're traveling down the road, the sons of Zebedee, some scholars believe the mom was Salome, or Salome. Uh, we don't have that verified. That's just first century history talking. And I, I'm not really sure how much I believe that, but she was known to the Lord. They probably had spent much time together because she came and she, she, she kind of, uh, I guess they had paused the entourage, maybe just 15, 20, maybe 50 to 60 were traveling with Christ as they're going to Jerusalem what would end up being that last time. And as Jesus was probably sitting there resting, maybe they were having a little nourishment, a little food to eat or something, she went and she bowed down and she made a request, a mom's request. I mean, it made sense to her. She assumed that it would make sense to Jesus and said, uh, I have something I want to, ask you, Lord, well, Jesus, what do you want? What do you wish? What are you thinking? What's going on in your mind? Listen to this statement. Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on the right hand and one on the left, in your kingdom. Uh, Lord, we know, now hear this. She's saying, in your kingdom. She sees something great in Christ. She believes. She's seen the miracles. Her heart, how many times did it beat within her? The warmth and the embrace when the words of truth that he spoke, the love that was there, it was so evident. And she knew that he was different. She knew that he was from God. She knew that he would come in his authority and power. But the worldly side said, I want more for my children than I even want for myself. So when you come into authority, would you give 
my son's authority and power as well. Would you allow one of them to be your right-hand man? Your other, your left. There will be people around you that you're going to need to lead in this government. Could my boys be there and be a part of that? And her boys were complicit in this. The other times in the other two Gospels when this is brought up, it just shares that James and John brought it up. It does not even bring into the intimacy here that, that, that their mom brings it up first. They knew. They wanted. They aspired to this leadership. They were hungry for their power. power. They had seen the authority in the world, and probably in their own heart they thought, you know, I could do that, and I could do that better. If I was in that job, this is the way I would do it. Clean the swamp, so to speak. We'll, this would be what would be important. <clears throat> Here we, they're standing up and their heart's showing a little bit. So Jesus addressed it and he, I think he looks not at her, I think he looks at the boys and says, do you know what you ask? There's ramifications for what you're trying to say here. Are you able to drink the cup? That, it, that means the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary for our sins. Are you able to do that? Are you willing to give your, your life? Are, are you willing to give all? Are you willing to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Literally, baptism, the, the cup shares what he did for us. The baptism is, is when we join in that effort together with him are you willing are you able can you do this listen to these words so simplistic but speak their heart well yes lord we're we're able we're willing we're ready you just speak the word we got it we're there for you so instead of really condemning them verse 23 says you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with my baptism. James, one of the two brothers, by the way, I think they were fiercely tempered. Sons of thunder, I believe these were men's men, rough, calloused hands. I think they probably used the wrong language every now and again. Y'all know what I'm saying? I think they were quick to judge, and they wanted everybody to hear them. He said, um, are you able? James will become the first martyr beheaded John will become the last close to 70 years after our Savior died on the cross of Calvary maybe a little over 70 years John will be exiled on the Isle of Patmos couldn't kill him what do you do with somebody you can't kill I mean they put him on an island where he couldn't preach to anybody but God still used him you ever heard of the book of the Revelation God still had a plan in his life. Kind of the bookends. Are you able? You, you, can you go through? Well, surely you will. But he said, but to uh, sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those to whom it is prepared by my Father. Look, I've got plans for you. And literally he is saying, it may not be what you're wishing and what you're wanting. It may not be your plans. You may want to sit on my right. You may want this position of authority, but it's okay. I've got a plan for you. It's better than that. I'm not going to give you what I want, but I, I do have plans. It's not going to be easy. Hold on. Y'all listening? Then Peter hears about it. And the other ten. And don't get on to them. They probably wanted the same thing. They all had the same ambition. They all wanted to be filled with power and authority. Sheila was talking about people wanting to be a preacher. Y'all come try it on sometime. <laughs> be careful what you ask for. It says, uh, greater judgment. I got that going for me. I'll be judged to a higher standard. But there's something about 
can we fulfill that? I just basically want to say that I don't think any of us can fulfill it, any of the plans that God has for our life, unless, number one, we understand that God's in control. Instead of us seeking control, we need to be under authority, not in authority. And we understand that those who are given authority that are under authority must fulfill what they've been given authority over. And a matter of fact, unless you're faithful in the small things, why should he make you faithful in the bigger things? In the same way that you love God in your every day, you're really allowing God to release his plans in your life. As you are faithful today, as you are saying yes to God today, as your heart is loyal to him today, as you're loving him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and as you are about his business, he will release unto you the greatness of this life that can be found only in Christ, in Christ alone. Only in Christ. So the other ten hear about it, and boy, the fight's gone. Don't you know it? I mean, there's posturing. There, there's probably some words being said. I think almost Jesus probably had to get in there and separate them out a little bit. I mean, there was a civil war among the disciples. And part of it's probably because... Those two got to him first. There might have been a little yeah, 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 because Jesus said, you're not getting it. They may have thought they were going to get it. Well, they're going to get it all right. Look in verse 25. Jesus called to himself, them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who are, have, who are great exercise authorities. You know how the world does it. There are those who have it and those who don't. And the ones who have it, uh, they're going to flaunt it. And, and, and if they've got the power and they've got the authority, you've got to bow to it. That's just all there is to it. You can yak about it. You can gripe about it. You can complain about it. You can sue someone about it. Is that going to change anything? Because those who have it, have it. Y'all didn't like that, did you? But you know I'm telling the truth. Now, you may come up and give me some idealistic viewpoint. Well, I think, well, you can think all you want to think. We all know what's happening in this world today. And how wonderful, come on now, how wonderful it would be if those in authority sought to do it well. Under, bowed humbly before the authority of God. But it's not always that way in this world. So he says, yet it shall not be so among you. If your identity, how you see yourself, is viewed by how others look at you, you're going to live life at a deficit. And I want to tell you, it is abundant. Some people have felt small their entire life. They don't feel worthy, and they've never felt worthy their entire life. Some see themselves, and, and they know that the, the few attributes that they have, and they blow those things up to be greater than everybody else's, and they just think the world should follow them. But God's going to put forth a plan here that I want us to grasp. Y'all listening? Can y'all give me five strong minutes? Let's let the Holy Spirit speak, because this is the will of God for the church. This is the will of God for, all, for the grand kingdom. This is the will of God for you personally. It's plain, it's simple, it's real, it's alive. He will amen it. He will empower it in your life. He will give you peace and love and joy and understanding if you will submit yourself to this will. It shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. To be great is to serve. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be slave, last. Let him be the one who yields. Come on now, no choice in the matter, but yields. Not trying to, I have my rights. Do you really? In our Constitution, we have the Bill of Rights. 
Well, this is as close as you're going to get to the Bill of Rights that God is coming. God, excuse me, God sent his son to come to this world to humbly yield to the path and the plan of God for him. If Philippians 2 tells us anything, it tells us that God emptied himself of everything that he rightfully deserved, that he was the son of God of heaven. But he emptied himself of that and he came as a servant. He came quiet for 30 years, not boasting, but serving and living. And when he began his life, he, he came with the truth of God to preach the truth of God, to live the truth of God, to see others, to serve others, to heal others. That was his plan. And we've been given the great privilege to follow that same plan, that with all that heaven desired for us, the DNA that he gave us, the passion of your heart and your soul that is God breathed, the love that he's put into your life, the family that he's placed around you, the circumstances and the opportunities and all those things are there. And instead of making that what your life is about, you humble yourself, you empty yourself and you come and you serve him and you are under him. And as Matthew 8 teaches, you have authority as you are under authority. And the more authority you're under, the more authority you'll have. Because this is the plan. Do you want your life to make a difference, sir? Do you want your life to have a lasting impact? Put others ahead of you. We're living for the dot instead of the line. Y'all know what I mean by that? Let's take our life, the Bible calls it a vapor. We just breathe it and it's gone. We're here, we're gone. Right? I was born May 24th, 1962 to Alton and Martha Stevens. I was born in Palaka, Florida. 57 and a half years later, I'm, I'm right here, I'm your pastor. Uh, I'm seeking to follow God's plan my life for my life. My, my, my obligation here is, is to be your pastor in how I serve you. That is my job. Everybody here knows that that's my job. That's my life. I don't know how much time God's going to give me, but whatever time he gives me, I want to run the rest of my days as fast as I can for the glory of God. I want to finish the, the I want to break that, uh, that, that finish line. I want to do it with my chest out. I want to do it with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want to leave a wife behind that knew that one thing for certain, that, that her husband loved her. I want my children to know that I put myself under them, that I put the, the truth of God there, and, and I showed them that truth, whether they liked it or whether they didn't like it, that I would come and I would preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, that I would live out a life before you that, so that you could see, hopefully see, that I am living what I'm preaching that I am flawed, that I am not perfect, but I have a plan for my life that was set for me. I didn't choose it. It was chosen for me. And, and when my life here is over, it is done on this earth. It is a moment. It is just a breath. That's the dot. But after I leave the dot, then my line begins. I mean... Maybe I'll live 57 years. Maybe I'll live 97 years. I hope God takes me before that. But whatever, I belong to him. But that, well, let's, let's say I make it to 100 because I like round figures. 100 years compared to 1,000, 10,000. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. Y'all good with that? Say amen. 100, 10,000. 10 trillion, 10 zillion, and we're this far. That ain't far. Well, let's say our line goes and hits the wind there. Can y'all see it? It's still going. It's still going. I just hit the clouds. There's rain in it, if y'all haven't figured that out lately. <laughs> Amen? I'm still going past the clouds. I just, I just passed Delta. And I'm going. I mean, 100 trillion. I'm still going. I'm past, 
I moved out into the atmosphere. I'm past the moon. I'm, I'm, out of the, I'm past the sun. I'm past the Milky Way. Hold on, my line's still going. I'm past this galaxy. 500 million light years beyond that, I just passed another one. I'm just getting warmed up. 100 trillion years, 100 trillion galaxies, and I'm still going. We can't grasp eternity, can we? But we can grasp that little dot. And we want to be the king of the dot rather than serve the king of eternity. And we want our life to be defined by how great we are in the dot. But he just made it real plain here, folks. Those that are truly great are those that are living for the line, not for the dot, not for the king of the dot, but serving the king of the line. It's not how much money I have. It's not how fashionable I am. It's not how many degrees or how smart or how many people brag on me. It's am I engaged with the, the Lord of the universe? Am I seeking to live his truth? Am I seeking to get down on my knees and bow and serve those that God placed before me to serve? Because I don't know where I'm going to meet the person that I'm going to make an eternal impact on. My days are not to be about me and the dot, but it's to be about you in the line. This is unbelievably simple. Every one of you can preach this. But it's unbelievably profound. Because what's going to change us from living through our wishes and wants to his? I have a lot of life verses. I have a lot of verses that mean so very much to me. One of them was written by supposedly one of the wisest people to live, they said about Solomon, when he wrote the book of Proverbs in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, and in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25, it says, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It's so important that he shared it twice. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Can I just flip that? There is a way that seems right unto God, and the end thereof are the ways of life. Are we going to live for us or for Him? Are we going to be willing to humble ourselves? Are we going to be willing to look beyond what I want, what I think, that there may be something better? Are we going to live for our wishes or his? The same truth that I'm following is the same truth you're following. It's in a person called Jesus. You know, it's a... I brought this today. Um, I have bunches and bunches of these and Five and a half years ago, I was writing in this one. And our, our little land that we're holding on to for a moment doesn't belong to me. The, I don't, nothing on the earth belongs to me. Uh, but I've got, I own half a road. <laughs> they call it Caribou. I call it Glory Lane. It's my, where I take a walk and talk with the Lord. I can't get on my knees very long anymore, but I can walk with the Lord, and I walk out and see the beauty of all the things that God's placed around us, and I go back and forth on that road, just lose track of time, just walking, praying with the Lord. Five and a half years ago, I felt God was asking me, what is it you want me to do for you? <clears throat> so in, in much prayer, much thought, I told the Lord, what I wanted him to do for it. What I thought would be, you know, if I were God for a day, well, God immediately began to work on my spirit. Immediately. And in here, 
it's kind of cool to be able to go back and read my thoughts the next day because he, he came back up with uh, some thoughts to uh, speak to me. There's a phrase in here. Um, Y'all ever heard of Oswald Chambers? My utmost for his highest. This began, uh, this was the week of November 10th, 2014. At some point in the day, I found myself before Oswald Chambers. The devotion spoke of my aim in life after salvation. If you seek great things for yourself, you put barriers to God's use of you. Personal interest or ambition will not allow you to identify with God's interest. My aim in life must be God's. When I stop telling God what I want, it allows him to start expressing what he wants. The next day, and I'm not reading, I'm, I'm skipping forward, on, on Wednesday, November 12th, I continued the thought of the blank check. I'll tell you about more of that, about that in a second. I studied for the midweek service on Matthew 13, Wheat and Tares. Lynn and I spent the afternoon together doing errands as we traveled to church. I asked God for a verse, and he gave me <laughs> 2 Chronicles 25, 2. Forgive me. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. Underneath that, I, I wrote, was my heart not loyal to myself, to my interest, to my service? I wanted the humble walk of a claim. And that's true. I wanted to claim, but I wanted it to look like I was being humble. Pride disguised as humility. I spent the day considering, I'm skipping down, I spent the day considering the loyal heart, how sin leads us to think only of ourself. Can I say that five years later, I still battle that. Five years later, I have to daily make sure that I put Christ first and I put myself second. Let me tell you what I meant when I said the blank check. God began to lead me to say, Brian, I want you to sign your name to the bottom line. Let me fill in the check. That means however much I put there, you're good with already. Are, we, are you willing to sign your name to a blank check? If you are, come to me. Sign one to me, and we'll see how willing you are. Well, obviously you wouldn't be because you don't trust me. But do you trust him? I also put down the blank sheet of paper, and I sign my name to the bottom of the blank sheet of paper and give it to him and say, okay, God, you fill in the rest. Sounds very religious, doesn't it? But here's the thing that I'm having to learn. I have to sign that check and that piece of paper every day. I'm either going to wake up and I'm going to live my life the way I want to that day. And if I live my life the way I want to that day, I might not have time for him. I may not have the desire to serve that day. I may put myself at the top of that pyramid. So I've got to be able to trust him to take care of my wife, to take care of my family, to take care of this church, to take care of my finances, to take care of everything else that's placed beneath me. To the point that God's given me authority, I need to make sure that I'm under his authority and I let him have full reign there. So I wonder how many lives would be different 
I wonder how many husbands and wives would be different. I wonder how many families would be different. I wonder how many churches would be different if we could learn just to sign it off. And, and, and I don't need to tell you that your job is to serve. You already know that. But are you willing to serve to his extent, his will, or to yours? What I found is, is that I was very good with God doing exactly what he, whatever he wanted to do to the extent that I was willing for God to do whatever he wanted to do. And when I wasn't, there was conflicting interest. I needed to change. Now, you're going to take this sermon one of two ways. You're going to take it as encouraging. Or are you going to take it like Jesus' disciples did when he said, oh, by the way, guys, we're going to Jerusalem. God's got a plan for this. And I'm going to fulfill that plan. God's already said this is what he wants to do in my life, and I am absolutely willing, yielded, totally all in to do that, even though I will be mocked, beaten, scourged, and crucified. Because beyond that, though they will bury me, he will resurrect me. Are we living for the dot? Or are we living for the line? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father God, this service is yours. These people belong to you. They do not belong to me. Father, they love you. They want your will to be done. Father, you're a great God. You're an encouraging God. You're a strong God. You're a loving God. And Lord, we all know what it means to serve. And we do serve. To the extent that we are open and we will allow you to. But Lord, oftentimes we will only serve you out of our ambition and not yours. So Father, I just pray that you take this word and apply it however you see fit. Father, I pray you humble us. I pray, Lord, that we would bow before you and worship. That we would be under authority because you are the authority. Lord, as the pastor of this church, can I just say, bless your people. Father, we get so up into our things and doing on our schedule. Help us pause. Help us pause. And Lord, help us realign ourselves to you. May this invitation be your will. Not more, not less, but purely your will. Speak as only you can. And sir, we'll give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.